Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 51st Blue Heads Virtual Seminar. Blue Heads Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Heads Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Reno Tadela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Heads Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Nathan Mulubrahan, the co-founder and CBT director here at Blue Heads Ethiopia to give a presentation on the approach and management of pulmonary embolism. So Dr. Nathan is an emergency medicine and critical care specialist. He's also the head of School of Medicine at Harm University. And as I have said before, co-founder and CPT director here at Blue Hills Ethiopia. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, yeah, Dr. Reno, for the, the nice introduction. So uh, again, well, uh, welcome everyone on our like, 50, 50 first webinar. So as already been discussed, I will discuss on approach and management of pulmonary embolism. So uh, this, this is going to be my uh, presentation outline. We'll discuss on the introduction of venous thromboembolism, and we'll see some of the incidence and prevalence of venous thromboembolism and pathophysiology, risk factors, clinical features, and scoring assessment in the diagnostic modality and finally we will discuss on the treatment of pulmonary embolism so uh, venous thromboembolism it's a, a combined syndrome of deep venous throm uh, thrombosis and pulmonary embolism so currently uh, it is the third most frequent acute cardiovascular syndrome globally uh, next to uh, myocardial infarction and stroke uh, regarding the incident the prevalence of uh, venous thromboembolism has increased in recent years uh, leading to a substantial uh, morbidity and mortality. The annual uh, rate of venous thromboembolism is high in high income countries. It is around 0 0.75 to 2.6 per 1,000 individuals. And this incidence is slightly uh, higher among uh, African Americans, but it is uh, lower in Asia and in Native Americans. So this is uh, data from the US. And uh, regarding the, uh, our country, there are different uh, literatures out there but uh, in general it is uh, it's not like currently well known about the incident of uh, this VT in our country uh, so uh, in general venous thromboembolism is predominantly this of uh, older age so the uh, prevalence as well as the incidence increase as uh, age increase the uh, and also regarding like sex ratio, uh, overall the age adjusted incidence rate is higher in male as compared to the females with 1.2 to 1 ratio. Uh, and the incidence rate somehow higher in women during the childbearing age. But after the age of 45, in general, it is uh, males that are highly affected by uh, venous thromboembolism uh, events. So when we come to the pathophysiology, usually the pathophysiology starts with the formation of thrombus in the deep veins of the lower leg uh, and also the upper, uh, the upper limbs can be affected by uh, venous thromboembolism, but the most common are the lower legs. And once there is the formation of thrombus, there will be propagation and embolization into the pulmonary arteries. So at the pulmonary artery level, uh, depend on the uh, size of the thrombus, either it can affect the uh, uh, gas exchange abnormalities or can have hemodynamic uh, alteration. So basically, when you talk about uh, uh, venous thromboembolism, specifically the pulmonary embolism, it has two main uh, pathophysiology, the uh, gas exchange abnormality and the hemodynamic uh, alteration. Uh, the other things we need to consider is uh, Pulmonary embolism can also occur uh, due to other factors like uh, fat emboli or amniotic fluid emboli or other like uh, cancerous cells. So not only the like the thrombus, also these factors can uh, cause um, uh, pulmonary embolism. And as you all know, the virtue triad is the cornerstone for uh, thrombus generation. So 
having like venous stasis, uh, hypercoagulable state, and endothelial damage. This the three factors are the main uh, risk factor for the thrombus uh, generation. So at the local level, when, whenever there is venous stasis due to different reasons, could be trauma or uh, other like different immobilities, uh, the, that the start, the blood will be uh, in a static state in the venous in the venous sinus or in the valves, uh, so that will lead to the formation of clots. And whenever when there is this um, risk factor, the clot will be extended due to the imbalance between coagulation and anticoagulation system, uh, especially the fibrinolysis system that we'll discuss later. So whenever there is imbal imbalance between these two, it could be due to the inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory states uh, or uh, other like uh, clinical conditions, the, the already formed thrombus will be uh, will propagate and the, eventually the, the thrombus will close it and detach to the other system of our body, especially the pulmonary arteries will be highly affected. So uh, when we see the predisposing factors, there are multiple uh, predisposing factors that contribute to the uh, occurrence of venous thromboembolism. Uh, these factors uh, have affect different uh, uh, mechanisms. They have different mechanisms, like the, from the three uh, virtue trials, they have their own different uh, uh, mechanisms that will affect. So when a patient has these predisposing factors and develop venous thromboembolism, we call it provocativity, and have almost have about half or two to two sort of the case, they have this triggering factor. So it is, we call it provocativity. So it is like classifying patients as provoked and then provoked has its own uh, management purpose. So again, uh, we'll discuss on the treatment uh, asp aspect later when the patient have provoked uh, P and then provoked V, they have their own uh, management. So. In general, uh, we can classify the risk factors as hyper those risk factors causing hypercoagulable states like gen uh, genetic coagulation uh, disorders, uh, anti antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, pregnancy, and uh, uh, purpurem uh, time uh, or usage of oral uh, contraceptives and hormone replacement, um, overweight and obesity, malignancy by itself is hypercoagulable state and rheumatoid disorders. This we consider this, uh, those as hypercoagulable state. And other are endothelial damage like bacterial infection, uh, viral infections uh, like the uh, COVID uh, the infection uh, or major trauma, if there is any major trauma, uh, surgeries and central line placement. This will cause endothelial damage so that the coagulation cascade uh, can be initiated. And the other is the venous stasis. Uh, as you all know, the venous stasis can be uh, caused by uh, physical inactivities or, as I have said, orthopedic disorders uh, or any like long distance air travel uh, or hospitalization. All these things can cause uh, venous stasis. So, in general, these are the major predisposing factor for the occurrence of uh, thrombus. So uh, this is just to show you the all factors of uh, this predisposing factor that I have already uh, mentioned uh, regarding the venous stasis. Uh, as you can see, uh, hospitalization have uh, highest uh, ratio of like increasing your chance of developing um, thrombus by a factor of ten, and uh, like physical activity and all these are. Uh, that we have already, I have already been uh, described. The other is hypercoagulable state. Again, uh, this shows you the uh, odds ratio of how these factors are contributing to the uh, generation of thrombus. So, and the other is endothelial damage. Also, uh, trauma, uh, as you can see, has high highest uh, odd factor of greater than ten. So. Uh, so when, whenever there is uh, thrombus formation due to uh, these uh, factors that uh, we have seen, that uh, thrombus will be propagated and uh, detached and uh, move to the pulmonary system and uh, it will cause uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, when, when there is PE, the first thing is the release of uh, vaso uh, active vasoactive mediators. And so this will cause 
the, the obstruction effect in the release of vasoactive mediators will cause the increase in pulmonary uh, vascular resistance. Then whenever there is pulmonary vascular resistance, the backflow of uh, blood will be uh, happening in the, uh, uh, the, in the pulmonary system. So that will increase the RV pressure. Then increasing RV pressure as uh, as you know, it is one of the major factor of uh, pulmonary embolism, so it will increase the RV pressure. So it, this will cause interventricular dependence and this drastically um, de decrease the cardiac output because whenever there is interventricular dependence, the uh, uh, RV will have much pressure on the left side of the heart, so that will decrease the preload and eventually will decrease the cardiac output. At the same time, uh, due to this the dislodged thrombus, there will be uh, vent ventilation perfusion mismatch and increment in uh, dead ventilation that will lead to uh, hypoxemia. And the other is due to the, again, the, uh, the dislodged uh, pulmonary embolism, there will be atelectasis and pulmonary hemorrhage that leads to shunting. And that's also another mechanism where uh, hypoxemia will occur. And also, um, this uh, uh, thrombus will cause uh, a, a stimulation of the pleural nerve, and that will lead to hyperventilation. And this hyperventilation by itself will cause uh, respiratory alkalosis. So, as you can see, uh, one uh, single thrombus has multiple uh, effects on the hemodynamic as well as the gas exchange mechanism. And that is the main, the main uh, pathophysiology when uh, we see the pulmonary embolism. So, the two, the gas exchange and hemodynamic effect are the two uh, main pa mm, yeah, pathophysiology. Regarding the clinical presentation, uh, the clinical presentation varies. Uh, so some of the patient will have will be asymptomatic and uh, whereas uh, the other patient will have complete, so present as a complete obstructive shock. And uh, eventually even some of the patient might present as a sudden death. So the most common clinical sign uh, when you see uh, studies, uh, shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain are the two most common uh, clinical presentation, but uh, there is no uh, specific clinical symptom or sign that uh, definitely uh, can uh, rule in uh, pulmonary embolism. So the, you need high index of suspicion whenever you face a patient with shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. So, uh, these are, uh, this table show, show us as the most common uh, sign and symptom of uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, as you can see, uh, shortness of breath or dizziness is the most common, like around 73% of the patient has uh, have the uh, dyspnea. And uh, the other is pleuritic chest pain, around 66% uh, in uh, Depoid trial one and on the, around 44% on Depoid trial two uh, have uh, pleuritic chest pain. And so, oh, but the other thing, all these symptoms can be, uh, tiny symptom can be the presentation of a patient with pulmonary embolism. So patient can have cough, leg swelling, leg pain, hemoptysis, palpitation, wheezing, angina like pain. Uh, they can even present with uh, fever. Uh, they can have abnormal cardiac examination. Uh, they can have accentuated or increased P2. Uh, so uh, all these mentioned signs and symptoms can be uh, the presenting symptom. And uh, patients can present with tachypnea, tachycardia, diaphoresis, cyanosis, uh, and uh, and also can can have like uh, symptom of DVT or confirmed DVT can be. The presentation sign of um, uh, pulmonary embolism. So, the presence of this sign and symptom um, they have fairly low, uh, like having only this sign and symptom, they have low sensitivity and specificity to reach the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. So, so we usually uh, do the risk assessment uh, of probability, and as you all know, we have different scoring methods. Uh, to calculate the risk probability of a patient uh, having a PE or not. So uh, in general, there are different validated and well-studied pre-test -prob uh, pre probability scoring, like Wales, the modified Wales scores, uh, simplified Wales, revised Geneva and simplified Geneva score. So uh, like we can see that the sensitivity of these scores range from 88 to 96%. 
so which is like it's good number and they have but low uh, specificity so around 48 to uh, 57 percent so we use this scoring uh, method to rule in uh, the or to to like to classify patients and whenever we have patients we need to do the the one of the pretest probability and if they have uh, low probability uh, intermediate probability or high probability again we'll go to the, the the algorithm that i'm going to show you next so uh, for example this is the uh, well uh, revised geneva and simple geneva so it has different clinical variables like age previous thromboembolic uh, uh, event surgical active malignancy surgery uh, unilateral leg pain hemoptysis or any tachycardia or oh, then you need to adapt this score and uh, you need to uh, put the patient on their risk of probability of having uh, pulmonary embolism. So, uh, so the other, uh, also on the, this is the Wales, uh, Wales score. So you can do the Wales score. So generally, uh, currently it's recommended to use either the Geneva, uh, uh, Geneva or the Wales score. So uh, whichever the scoring system you are used, you need to classify patients. Uh, so whenever you have a patient present with sign symptom of uh, PE, so as we have already been discussed, the signs, uh, sign and symptom alone, they have low uh, probability for uh, clean, uh, reaching the diagnosis of PE. So uh, when you have clinical suspicion of PE, uh, you need to assess the clinical probability using either Wales or the Geneva criteria. So based on that, you, you will have either low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability. So when you have low probability, you can you have two options. You can do the PERC score. So uh, on the PERC score, it has around uh, nine components. So within these nine components, if the patient has one of the risk factor from this all mentioned nine score, then you need to do the uh, D-dimer. Otherwise, if they have all negative, then you can safely say that this patient has no PE. The other is the intermediate probability. So whenever there is a patient with intermediate probability in the, uh, the clinical assess assessing tools, either the Wells or Geneva, then you have to do D-dimer. Then within the dimer, if the patient has the positive D dimer result, then that's the guarantee for further uh, workup like uh, CT or VQ, VQ scan. Uh, but if the patient has negative D dimer, then you can safely rot PE. But if you have from the outset high PE likely with the Wales or Geneva, then you don't need to do the D dimer result, just you can directly go to the um, uh, CT, CT primary angio or VQ scan. So this is the PERC criteria. It is uh, primary embolism rod criteria or we call it PERC. So as I have already said, it has around nine components. So yeah. all these are the risk factors. The first one is clinical low probability or the gestalt of the physician or if the physician believes that the patient has uh, risk, uh, the diagnosis of the um, patient is PE, that's one risk factor. The other is age, uh, pulse, uh, saturation, hemoptysis, prior, any uh, venous thromboembolism event, surgery, estrogen use, or unilateral leg pain. If any of these factors are present, then your PERC uh, is tells you that you need to do the D-dimer test. So uh, currently, if you, you have no D-dimer and you have low probability, directly you can do the PERC and safely rule out the pulmonary embolism. So regarding the biomarkers, the first one is D-dimer. Uh, as you know, D-dimer, it is one of the fibrin degradation products. So when uh, the cloth is uh, uh, degraded, uh, we, we it, one of the, uh, the product is D-dimer. So we use this D-dimer as a biomarker for um, any venous thromboembolism event. So it should be primarily used to rule out PE in patients with low and intermediate probability, as I have already uh, explained. So low probability, it's also possible to use PERC instead of D-dimer. But if you have high probability from the outset, you don't need to 
uh, test the dimer just right away you go to the advanced imaging so uh, the cutoff level for d dimer uh, we use around 500 microgram per liter but there are different factors like the uh, in inflammatory states infection malignancy can like elevate the, the level of d dimer so uh, like you need to also consider these factors whenever you decide uh, when you have the d dimer results uh, in your hand so uh, there is also age adjustment cutoff value for d dimer so this age adjusted cutoff value has uh, like better accuracy than just using only the 500 microgram per liter cutoff value so if it's possible you have to use age adjusted cutoff cut cutoff value for uh, d dimer so uh, this picture is uh, just to show you the where the d dimer uh, came from so on the final stage of uh, clot formation, as you know, uh, factor uh, factor 13, activated factor 13A will uh, cross link, like the fibrin will be cross linked by uh, factor uh, 13A. Then this cross linked fib, uh, fibrin will be degraded by the plasmin. So, this uh, the degradation of uh, fibrin will uh, be. Uh, D dimer and other fibrin degradation product. So we use this D dimer to test uh, whether uh, there is uh, active clot or not. So uh, just the base of this uh, D dimer test. And the other uh, biomarker is uh, troponin. So we usually uh, use troponin for the just to rule out or to rule in uh, myocardial infraction. But in the context of uh, pulmonary embolism, troponin uh, is suggestive of the prognostic, prognostic, tells prognostic value. At the same time, it tells you the severity of the pulmonary embolism and it has, uh, it tells you that the patient has hemodynamic uh, in instability. So, uh, in patient with intermediate and high probability uh, scoring or from uh, uh, those intermediate and high probability PE, you need to determine the troponin because it has uh, prognostic uh, value and uh, around like 30 to 60 percent of the patient with PE have elevated troponin and it tells you uh, uh, short term risk mortality. Uh, the pro it has. Uh, High patient with elevated troponin, they have high risk of short term days. So, uh, should be measured in intermediate and high risk patient, as uh, I have said. Positive troponin in patient with intermediate risk category, uh, like increase their like, category to intermediate high level if they have positive troponin level. So, and if you have positive troponin value in patient with uh, intermediate risk, you need to aggressively. Uh, do the lytic therapy, thrombolytic has to be aggressively uh, given for this category of patients. So the other uh, biomarker is uh, BNP and uh, pro-BNP. Again, uh, uh, it's not currently uh, advised to use this uh, BNP or uh, pro-BNP for PE patient, but uh, like that of troponin, they have uh, low diagnostic yield, but again, it tells you that uh, the, the the severity of the um, PE in patients. So uh, whenever there is uh, pr high pressure in the ventricles, this BNP and pro-BNP will be released uh, from the ventricle so as there will be uh, diuresis. Uh, so in patients with high level of BNP, it tells you that the severity of the uh, PE. So the other uh, is uh, ECG or electrocardiogram. So on ECG, we mainly use uh, if we have fine index of suspicion P, we can uh, do the ECG. And again, it tells you the prognostic information. So um, the main purpose, the other main purpose is it, it tells you alternative diagnosis like myocardial infraction because patients can have chest pain, a short sense of breath, uh, can be present as myocardial infraction. So it can also be used as to rule out those uh, differential diagnoses. And when specifically see the pulmonary embolism sign on ECG, the most common one is uh, tachycardia. So around 38% uh, of the patient will have tachycardia. And again, 38% of the patient will have T-wave inversion and S-segment elevation in AVR. Uh, these are highly uh, sensitive, but they are not specific signs. But the most specific sign is what you call S1Q3T3 pattern. So uh, 
what you call the S1 Q3 T3 pattern is where on the lead one you will have deep uh, S wave and on lead three you will have uh, Q wave and inverted T wave so if you have this uh, specific mm -hmm. designs uh, it is highly suggestive of uh, PA and also it, it has uh, high uh, like uh, prognostic value so if the patient has this S1 Q3 T3 pattern it tells you that there is uh, hemodynamic, hemodynamic instability and the patient has poor prognostic. So uh, the others, uh, they kind of like incomplete RBB. Uh, all like all this, uh, the, uh, like ECG findings can be the presentation, presenting sign of the pulmonary embolism. So uh, fairly patients can have different presentation on uh, ECG, but uh, as I've said, the most uh, specific one is S1, Q3, T3, and the most sensitive one is the, the one mentioned on 1, 2, 3, which is tachycardia, T-wave inversion, and H segment elevation. So uh, this is what so I've already discussed regarding the chest X-ray. Chest X-ray is not specific, but can be even normal in quarter of a patient with P. Uh, most common finding, they can have cardiac enlargement, uh, pulmonary fusion, elevated hemidiaphragm, uh, uh, like pulmonary artery enlargement, atelectasis, and uh, parenchial uh, pulmonary infiltrates. These are some of the signs that patients with chest X, uh, P with chest X-ray can present. And also, uh, the main use of chest X-ray is not to rule out PE, but to rule out other differential diagnosis like uh, pneumothorax, uh, and pneumonia can be ruled out using uh, chest X-ray or can be as at least uh, supportive diagnostic for other differential diagnosis. And regarding the AVG, uh, on AVG we don't have specific uh, like sign specific uh, diagnostic criteria for P, but usually it can be abnormal and and having like more worsened uh, acidosis can be a sign of uh, poor prognost prognostic on PE. So the other hypoxemia without obvious length finding, or if you get hypoxemia on a BG without any um, clear length finding on chest X-ray on uh, ultrasound can tell you that at least uh, you can consider uh, pulmonary embolism. The most common finding is hypoxemia with widened uh, A gradients with low, uh, CO2 level, this is the most common finding, but it's not like specific and you can have various finding on AVG. And the other is uh, echo. On echo, uh, on echo at least we can see um, different, uh, or we can classify with three categories. The first one is anatomical finding, uh, which we call it thrombi in the transit. The other is we can measure the chamber size. And the third one, you can assess the, uh, at least the function and uh, general contractility of the, uh, especially the right side of the heart. So uh, on echo, we can have this. So when we see uh, thrombine, uh, uh, thrombine transit, it's seen in the right uh, heart chamber, but it is, uh, it's not common to have this thrombine transit. So unless there is high burden of clots, you don't see this thrombi in, in the, the transit. So uh, the other thing, thrombi have potential to cross intraatrial septum. So when, when patient have uh, develop PE, the right side of the heart will have like higher pressure. So that will create, um, that might like reopen the, what you call the ASD so that they can have paradoxical uh, symptoms. So patient can present with stroke, or like system this involvement like AK or stroke can be uh, present presenting symptom with a patient with venous thromboembolism. So thrombi uh, in transit is not common thing that to see, but if you get that, it tells you there is hyperden of uh, the clot. So the other right uh, heart size enlargement uh, can be again the diagnostic uh, clue for uh, pulmonary embolism. So whenever there is right side chamber enlargement and right side uh, pressure enlargement. It tells you that uh, there is increment in pulmonary vascular resistance. So due to the uh, clogged uh, clot, there will be subtle enlargement of the right, right side pressure and volume. So on, on echocardiography, so you can easily uh, see the right side enlargement and you can also calculate the tricuspid pressure and uh, you can like, 
at least suggest the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary embolism. The other specific echo signs, we can have Marconil sign on uh, this Marconil sign, it is specific for uh, pulmonary embolism. So unlike that of the other uh, RV dysfunctions on the Marconil sign, what we see is a regional uh, pattern of RV dysfunction. So there will be uh, a kinesis of the RV free world, but the uh, apex will be normal. So it is a specific sign for um, Marconil, a specific sign for pulmonary embolism. So this finding is yeah, as I have said, in contrast to the other LV dysfunction, uh, the other RV dysfunction will cause globalized uh, RV wall motion abnormalities, but uh, on PE it is specific, so it has positive predictive value of around 71% and uh, negative predictive value of 96%. And also we have also other like other signs like the 60 uh, that are specific for the PE. So the other on um, chest uh, CT angio, chest CT is it is the most common imaging modality that we use uh, for pulmonary embolism, and it uh, can easily identify a clot uh, as when whether there is filling defect or not uh, after using the contrast. So the diagnostic sensitivity it is around ninety uh, percent and does high. The sensitivity it's not that much adequate. And the other is the VQ, VQ scanning. So on VQ, you can identify uh, perfusion, perfusion defect when uh, ventilation is normal. So uh, the first image will be uh, give, uh, taken is the ventilation after administering IV contrast. After that, the patient will nebulize aerosolized isotope and the uh, ventilation scan will be uh, taken. So uh, uh, for example, when you see this image, the first row is the perfusion scan. So after administrating the uh, IV contrast, you will take the uh, perfusion scan. So on the dark arrow, it shows there is some uh, missing perfusion. So on the ventilation part, but on the ventilation, there is no problem. So you need like to compare the ventilation and perfusion scan and Again, on VQ scan, it, it tells you the probability of having the patient P. It's not the definitive diagnostic, but it, it tells you that the patient has low probability, high probability P. So uh, at least this is how we do the uh, VQ scan. So uh, when we come to the management, uh, management wise, we need to uh, approach patients with, as usual, any critical ill patient with the ABCD approach and management mainly focus on the uh, respiratory support, uh, hemodynamic resuscitation and pharmacology therapy of the pulmonary embolism and complication treatment and uh, finally the prevention aspect. So uh, the management is goes like this. So uh, when when talk about the uh, respiratory support, patients with high risk P might present with severe hypoxemia uh, caused mainly the VQ mismatch. So in this patient, hypoxemia worsens the hemodynamic profile due to the hypoxic uh, vasoconstriction. So we need to at least address the hypoxemia. The other thing, patients can also present with hypercap uh, hypercapnia, which again can occur due to decreased cardiac output. If they have hemodynamic instability, that will cause decreased in cardiac output that eventually cause hypercapnia. So aggressive management of hypoxemia and hypercapnia is critical in patient, uh, critical in this uh, kind of patient. So uh, respiratory support, currently in addition to the conventional oxygen supplement, like using tranasal oxygen face mask, uh, it's like studies show that high flow nasal cannula also has uh, like, like better uh, effect, uh, as you know, high, high flow nasal cannula, we administer high flow uh, oxygen as, as high as a 60 liter per minute uh, with warm and humidified air. So um, at least patients, when you administer positive pressure in patients with P, it has a deleterious effect because it will decrease the uh, cardiac output due to decrease in preload. So. Uh, if you have a high flow nasal cannula in your center, uh, at least you can try to using high flow nasal cannula initially. 
So uh, use of endotracheal intubation in positive pressure is very uh, problematic in patient with P because uh, whenever you use endotracheal intubation, you are going to administer induction agent. So this induction agent will decrease your the cardiac output and mean arterial pressure. And also you will administer positive uh, pressure ventilation. This will increase your pulmonary vascular resistance and also decrease the venous return to the right side of the heart that will decrease the cardiac output. So uh, we don't like to use positive pressure in patients with P, but if it is a must, you, you are going to at least uh, choose uh, induction agent that have like low or minimal uh, cardiovascular event like etomidate or ketamine can be used as induction agent. And whenever it's possible, you need to optimize the blood pressure before you know, like intubating the patient. So as much as possible, you need to give bolus fluid and start patient on vasopressor. So the other, uh, regarding the oxygenation, you need to minimize the hypoxemia during intubation. So in the apneic period, uh, you can do the apneic oxygenation. So you just simply, you can administer intranasal oxygen while uh, doing the intubation. And the other is preventing abrupt increase in uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. So you need to maintain normal PO2 P and PO2 and using the lowest possible PIP because you, if you have like higher PIP and that will uh, decrease your cardiac output. So as much as possible, low PIP is recommended for uh, patient with uh, positive uh, ventilation. So the other uh, hemodynamic support uh, that one of the definition like to classify patient as uh, like high risk P is the presence of hemodynamic instability. So if a patient present with cardiac arrest or if they have uh, obstructive shock, uh, when we say obstructive shock, patient with on vasopressor or persistent hypotension lasting longer than 50 minutes. So if you have these criteria, so by definition, you are having high risk P. So in this kind of patient, you need aggressive hemodynamic support. So the first thing you have to do is uh, fluid resuscitation. After that, you are going to uh, go to the iometrope and vasopressor support. And if that fails, finally, you go to the extracorporeal life support like uh, ECMO. So regarding the fluid management, uh, fluid loading cause an increase in right ventricular in diastolic volume index. So we need that because the right ventricle is pumping against uh, high uh, pressure due to the uh, obstruct, obstruction of the pulmonary artery. So uh, you need to administer at least a bolus of uh, 100 to 250 ml fluid. Uh, you need to administer that and you need to reevaluate your patient fluid responsiveness. So uh, for example, in our center, we use ultrasound to do the fluid responsiveness test, but if you don't have that, at least you can use a passive leg raise test or any other fluid assessment method, but you need to re-evaluate your patient and reassess the fluid responsiveness. And if, if they are found to be fluid responsive, you need to again administer additional bolus of fluid. So uh, one of the main state of management uh, of the pulmonary embolism is fluid management, especially in uh, centers like us where there is not a thrombolysis uh, is available, so as much as possible, the, you need to focus on the supportive management. So once you are done with the fluid management, uh, you need to consider vasopressors. So the main purpose of uh, vasopressor is to increase systemic vascular resistance. So incrementing systemic vascular resistance, uh, so directly means increase the mean arterial pressure. So whenever there is increment in mean arterial pressure, that again leads to uh, incremental preload and that will uh, prevent RV uh, ischemia. So the mainstay or the first line choice of vasopressor is norarenaline. So uh, norarenaline is associated with increased in pulmonary vascular resistance, but uh, it is systemic vascular resistance effect is more profound than the pulmonary vascular resistance effect. So, so the first line we use is norarenaline. So, uh, as you know, it is mild, it has also mild uh, beta adrenergic effect, so that will also increase the RV function. So the other is the ionotropes, or ionotropes. 
usually we don't like use inotropes in patients with P, but if you are like thinking to increase the contractility of blood, you can use dobutamine uh, is the first line, and also you can use uh, adrenaline as as inotrope uh, agent. So the main uh, management is the vasopressor, but if you like you are, you are thinking to uh, augment the uh, cardiac contractility, you can use uh, ionotrope as well. So uh, the other is uh, pulmonary vasodilators. So uh, the most effective way uh, to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance, as you know, is to decrease the clot burden by using uh, thrombolytics. But uh, on the pathophysiology, uh, as we have discussed, this pulmonary vascular resistance is not only caused by the clot burden, but there are others like vasoactive agents uh, like thrombaxin and serotonin. So, uh, so they have done research uh, regarding this area uh, where they have given uh, uh, some pulmonary vasodilators to, to relieve some of the pulmonary vascular resistance in patients with P. Uh, but one of the most uh, studied one is nitric oxide and nitric oxide show some uh, uh, benefits regarding the correction of ventilation perfusion mismatch in patients with uh, P. Uh, it has uh, both uh, a venodilator effect, uh, arteriodilator effect, as well as it has antiplatelet aggregation effect. So it has multiple effects, uh, but currently it's not uh, recommended because there are no that much strong, uh, strong uh, like research studies show the effect of nitric oxide. So um, like the studies are based um, based on just uh, case reports. So. It's not recommended, but out of option, you can consider as well nitric oxide or as a management of uh, decremented pulmonary vascular resistance. So the other uh, cardiac arrest management. So uh, recent guidelines, there is no uh, difference between uh, P cardiac arrest and other types of cardiac arrest. So you need to uh, like stick with the uh, ACLS protocol. But in patients with cardiac arrest due to pulmonary embolism, if you have like uh, availability of bedside echo, so we can see the evidence for the uh, evidence for pulmonary embolism, like significant uh, acute RV dysfunction. So in this patient, you can consider uh, thrombolytics. So if thrombolytics is available, so a bolus dose of thrombolytics can be uh, considered in patients with uh, car, car, who sustained cardiac arrest after the sustaining um, pulmonary embolism. So uh, these thrombolytics, usually it's recommended to be given in the ICU uh, setup. So if you have that, you, you need to ad admit patients to the ICU, then you, uh, as much as possible, you have to administer the thrombolytics. So regarding cardiac arrest, the same management, the only difference is you need to administer uh, thrombolytics as well. So the other uh, pharmacological, Management of P, we can classify the management into three uh, three spectrums. The first one is uh, the initial the initial or acute phase. The second one is the primary treatment, which which usually starts uh, three three months to a year. And the last one is long term management, which if the patient have uh, unprovoked type of uh, venous thromboembolism, so they need to be they, to be treated with extended treatment. Uh, or and also secondary prevention has to be started in this kind of patient. So regarding the thrombolytic therapy, uh, we can use either systemic or direct catheter, catheter uh, thrombolytics. Uh, so uh, we have different options of thrombolytics and the mainstay of management for a patient with uh, pulmonary embolism is administration of thrombolytics, as you all know. So uh, regarding thrombolytics, uh, we have uh, different generation of thrombolytics starting from first generation to the third generation. And we can classify thrombolytics as fibrin specific and non fibrin specific. So, those fibrin specific uh, thrombolytics, uh, they have to be um, attached to fibrin in order to uh, initiate their action, whereas non fibrin specific uh, thrombolytics, they don't need the available to fibrin, so they directly inactivate plasminogen. So so they can have uh, active or high level of plasmin, so that can degrade the already formed clot. So first generation uh, 
thrombolytics, streptokinase and urokinase are the first generation and the oldest uh, thrombolytics that you have. So they are a single chain polypeptides and the protein is bound with the proactive, uh, proactivated plasminogen. Then this complex uh, will convert inactive plasminogen to active plasmin. So as you know, this is the one plasmin is the one that will degrade the uh, already the clot will be degraded by using the enzyme plasmin. So the, this is tryptokinase and uh, urokinase they act on the uh, plasminogen. Uh, they convert plasminogen to the active plasmin. So uh, usually the uh, plasminogen is concentrated in the thrombus and on the surface. So hence the action of streptokinase occurs within the thrombus as well as on the surface. So they have uh, both, unlike the second and third generation, they act on the both on the surface of the clot as well as within the clot. So second generation uh, one, the Altipase is the only second, uh, second generation uh, TPA that's uh, FDA approved for the use of uh, uh, systemic thrombolysis. Uh, systemic thrombolysis that FDA approved for the use of pulmonary embolism is Altipase. So it, uh, Altipase uh, is responsible for the conversion of uh, plasminogen to plasmin. So it converts uh, plasminogen to the active form of plasmin. So uh, Altipase needs uh, fibrin. So uh, fibrin as a cofactor to activate uh, plasminogen. So uh, whenever there is uh, yeah, a high level of fibrin, the effect of altipase will be uh, augmented. So the third generation is then ten place and right place are the third generation uh, thrombolytics. So both they undergo modification to, and the main difference is they have longer half-life than that of altipase. So uh, right place can be given as like two boluses, but uh, ten 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 place is given as a single uh, those and uh, so basically the main difference is the, uh, the longer half-life in the service generation. So uh, regarding the systemic and uh, catheter, direct catheter uh, related therapy, so on the catheter direct uh, catheter therapy, uh, what we use is um, smaller amount of dose, dose as compared to the systemic dose and so uh, Catheter direct therapy seems to be promising, but there is no, uh, currently, there is no direct uh, study that comparative study was not done uh, about the uh, systemic and uh, catheter uh, direct therapy. So still, um, as you cannot like say the catheter is better than systemic because uh, there is no data supporting that, but whichever is available in our center, you can use uh, either of the systemic or uh, catheter directed therapy. The other option is surgical embelectomy. If available, uh, surgical embelectomy is can be done, especially in those young patients and have having proximal pain that can be done. And uh, this the main advantage of the having this uh, surgical embelectomy is it, it, it has a small amount of chronic complications. So considering the chronic complication. It's much uh, smaller in uh, surgical uh, surgical option than that of the thrombolytic therapy. The other uh, management is uh, the usage of anticoagulants. So on anticoagulants, we have uh, different option. So uh, the first one is the heparin. So we have the unfractionate heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and uh, pentasaccharides can be used. And uh, on the top of that, we can use either a vitamin K antagonist or uh, direct oral anticoagulant. So uh, I'm not going to discuss in detail about the dosage and uh, contraindication indication on the, these anticoagulants, but uh, uh, so you need to read on that. Uh, so the other extended anticoagulation use on the chronic phase after the completion of the primary treatment, uh, lasting three to six months, those patients uh, with unprovoked uh, pulmonary embolism or patients with ongoing risk factor, if they have ongoing risk factor, you need to administer this extended uh, use of anticoagulation. So uh, can be used. So uh, the choice of uh, this anticoagulant can be uh, it depends on the patient factor, so we need to consider different uh, patient factor. Uh, 
uh, for, for example, if the patient has, for example, anti-phospholipid antibody, uh, in that case, uh, or direct oral anticoagulants are contraindicated, so you, you need to stick with them. The, the traditional vitamin K antagonist, if the patient has mechanical prostatic valve, uh, if they have like a patient with uh, in-stage renal disease, uh, and if they have patient's preferences to use vitamin, uh, direct uh, vitamin K antagonist, uh, these are some of the indication to use uh, vitamin K antagonist. The main issue is uh, vitamin K antagonist, you need to monitor the INR uh, regularly, so uh, the dose will, has to be adjusted based on the available the, the value of uh, INR, but you don't need to worry about the INR on uh, direct oral anticoagulants. So, in patients with kidney dysfunction, uh, you have to at least use a Pixivan uh, or you can use Rivax, Rivaroxaban. In patients with GI bleeding or chemical disease, based on each types of the case uh, case specific scenario you need to specifically select the types of oral anticoagulant in extended uh, period so uh, the other uh, we have two different option uh, for uh, overlapping and uh, continuing patients with anticoagulant the first one is that what we call the traditional approach so in this case i think usually in our hospitals, we use this the traditional approach. So we have, uh, we start patients with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin uh, or enoxaparin, then we'll, we'll go and start uh, warfarin or vitamin K antagulant. Uh, so after that, after the overlapping period, around three to five days, patients will be uh, started with the only uh, vitamin K antagonist. And after that, uh, if they need extended periods, uh, then they will be put on again vitamin K antagonist with the monitoring of INR. The other is using the, the new no novel drugs or what you call direct oral anticoagulant. So th the same, they have to start with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And here there is no overlapping, just we directly uh, continue with the either direct uh, uh, factor 10 inhibitors or the thrombin inhibitors. So based on the uh, availability of uh, oral anticoagulant, either you can use the traditional approach or uh, is the, new, the newer approach. So uh, this is all about the uh, uh, the approach in management of P. So, if you have any question, I will address that. Thank you very much, Doctor. I believe there are about six questions in the Q and A section. We can move to that. Okay. The first one from first question from uh, uh, Dinka: Can pulmonary embolism occur without the uh, formation of thrombus? Uh, yes, uh, as I uh, have already discussed, uh, other factors like fat embolism, uh, amniotic fluid embolism can also cause uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, there are rare cases, but uh, it can occur. Uh, the second the one, 54-year-old patient with ARDS, pulmonary edema CKD was intubated for two days, started on HD, what's HD? And uh, on heparin prophylaxis, those develop PT on the three day of admission, no DVT. For how long should we she take warfarin? Provoked and provoked. So if it is uh, provoked, that's good. We know the risk factor. So usually uh, you'll mm -hmm. give uh, warfarin for three to six months. And after the three to six months, you need to reassess the patient condition. And if those risk factors are present, you need to continue the the, the warfarin management. Otherwise, if those factors are not present, you, you will discontinue. But if it is unprovoked, uh, um, unprovoked one, you need to continue uh, the you need to continue the warfarin. Uh, how long does it take for a patient with DVT on treatment so you have to become symptom free? After treatment, uh, symptom free, it depends, it depends on the patient. So some of the patients, they will develop chronic complications like uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, post-acute uh, post PE. 
So it depends on the, the condition, special. Uh, so there is no specific time to uh, say the symptom free time. Initially, if the patient have significant hemorrhage and compromise, significant hypoxic insult, they might end up having the long term pulmonary hypertension, whereas in patients with mild uh, mild P or from the outset, they can be asymptomatic. So uh, it depends on the patient scenario. Uh, I think uh, that's from that's a lot question. Massive and some massive P. When when we see massive P, there's uh, the one with high risk P or patient with hemodynamic instability. So if the patient is cardiac arrest or if the patient is having uh, hypotension initially with systolic pressure less than 90, or if you are requiring vasopressor to maintain high uh, systolic pressure above 90, that's massive P. But some massive P patient with symptomatic uh, sim having like sign symptom of P, uh, the one that we described the symptom, but if there is no hemodynamic instability, that is some massive P. Uh, what is the indication for thrombolytics agent? Uh, I think I have already discussed the indication for thrombolytics. The first one, if, if the patient has hemodynamic instability, and uh, that's the, the high, the high risk P, cal those high risk P, meaning uh, hemodynamic instability with hypotension, cardiac arrest, or uh, hypoxemia, these are the, uh, the right away indications. Otherwise, if the patient is asymptomatic or asymptomatic P, you don't need to administer thrombolytics. Mm, what is, how long, how long is extended therapy? It depends. Uh, if again, like usually it's lifelong, you know, if unprovoked um, P on it, they are going to take a uh, lifelong um, P, IL, HILU, pregnant suspected P, that's a good question. In the pregnant ladies, uh, we only use low molecular weight heparin, so we don't use other types of uh, heparin, so, uh, and warfarin is contraindicated, so as, as long as the pregnancy is considered the, the mother has to be treated only with uh, low, low molecular weight heparin. Pregnancy and diagnostic modality in P from Getacho. So uh, it's the same, there is no, but those clinical uh, risk factors and uh, those diagnostic modalities, they have the same predict, predict, predictive value as compared to the general population. The main manage, difference is regarding the management in pregnancy. Pregnancy, um, as I've said, low molecular use, low molecular weight heparin. What to consider? When to consider fat embolism in management? Uh, fat embolism, it is especially common after having a large bone uh, fra fracture, like uh, femoral fracture. So uh, usually they have the triads of uh, chemosis, uh, change mutation, and hypoxemia. So if in this kind of patient, you need to consider fat embolism. So management is just supportive management will be given for fat embolism patient. Uh, so there is no specific uh, like management for fat embolism, just supportive management. They have high uh, mortality risk. They have higher mortality risk uh, in fat embolism. So again, high index of suspicion in fat embolism. Likelihood of developing PT in patient with prophylactic anticoagulation. Likelihood of developing PT in patient with uh, this one. Uh, I'm not sure the likelihood. I think uh, I need to come up with the number uh, from the survey. The most common cause of PE is proximal leg or pelvic activity, but in Harrison said that calf activity is the most common cause of paradoxical PE. Was the reason, I'm not, I'm not sure what to call, but as you have seen, the most common cause of P is proximal, uh, pro from the proximal or from pelvic, the calf from the uh, lower uh, leg DVT, uh, usually they don't cause P unless they uh, extend to the proximal part of the leg. So the from the distal part, we don't expect uh, the DVT, but the, I'm not sure about the paradoxical P uh, in the calf DVT. Um, question What things to consider in switching vitamin K antagonist like warfarin to uh, direct or anticoagulant if no contraindication? 
the first one, as I've said, the INR monitoring. INR, there is no uh, INR monitoring in uh, vitamin K. Another in vitamin K, it has its own uh, like risk factors, uh, complications uh, using vitamin K. So a patient with a liver failure, uh, uh, or if the patient has like developed this ecchymosis uh, after starting vitamin K, you, uh, it's, you can like switch to direct oral anticoagulant. What could be done if patient? What could be done if the patient was shocked with massive P, thrombolytics may not be available. Just you'll continue with the uh, fluid resuscitation yeah. and your uh, CPR, uh, money, CPR, you will do the CPR and you'll continue the fluid management. Mm. Comparison, weight pace versus traditional. Anonymous mm. attendee. I don't understand your question. Comparison. When do you stop warfarin if you don't know whether a PT is provoked and provokes? So if, if this is like a provoked one, there, there has to be a risk factor, but unprovoked one, a patient is without any risk factor. So uh, if you don't have any risk factor, by default, that is unprovoked uh, uh, PT. When to discontinue anticoagulant if provokes, as I have already said, uh, three to six uh, months. Is there any specific time limit to consider thrombolytics in patients with massive P? Uh, with massive P, as much as possible, you need to consider thrombolytics right away. So if the thrombolytics is available, uh, you need to consider thrombolytics right away. If your center is uh, ICU center color, that's better. As always, even in the emergency, you can you have to consider the administration of thrombolytics. So I believe we have answered all, all questions almost. So on behalf of Blue Hills Ethiopia and all our participants, thank you very much, Dr. Nathan, for the nice presentation. And we hope we will meet with other topics in the near future. And thank you and good night. If you have any last remarks that you want to address, please do. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Thank you uh, again, Bluehouse, for this uh, platform. So, uh, I think we have tried to rush through the um, uh, approach in management of uh, pulmonary embolism. So, uh, the main thing is high index of suspicion in patients with pulmonary embolism. So, I know uh, most of our center we don't have thrombolytics. So. Uh, as much as possible, you need to uh, focus on the um, uh, hemodynamic stability management and the respiratory support. And uh, I think that's all uh, I have. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Doc, and good night. Okay, good night.